Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here, TradeAthletics.com. Uh, today we're going to talk about a slightly technical topic, uh, which is that not all layback is created equal. So we're going to dive into exactly what layback means versus external rotation at the shoulder. Uh, and then this is a video that, although it's more technical and you might not have kind of an anatomical background, uh, I would encourage you to stick through this video, whether you're a coach, whether you're a player. Um, at the very least, you're going to understand more about the biomechanics of how the throw works. And at most, you're going to have information to use both from a performance standpoint and also from an injury prevention standpoint. We need to understand that layback is actually not the same thing as external rotation of the shoulder. Now, for the first five, six, seven years of my kind of training career, I thought they were the same thing. I thought shoulder external rotation was the exact same thing as layback, and I used them synonymously for years. Now, the difference is that layback refers to the summation of joint angles. Layback refers to the position that you're able to get into at that, at that specific kind of late cocking point, as it's sometimes called in the throw, right? That's the position when someone says, oh, he's got 180 degrees of layback. They're referring to actually a summation of, of joints that, that create that position. External rotation specifically refers to the motion of the humerus in the glenoid fossa, so the, the ball and socket rotation. So that's only actually one piece of layback. Layback is actually the summation of uh, multiple things. And so I'll kind of demonstrate this. One, it's a summation of shoulder external rotation. That's true ball and socket rotation. It's also contributed to by scapular posterior tilt, which is the scapula being able to tilt back this way. You can see I'm getting that range from taking my scapula from anterior tilt to posterior tilt. And then finally, T-spine extension rotation. So if I'm stuck in this uh, kyphotic posture, I can actually get more effective layback combining this scapular posterior tilt and T-spine extension. And that's why you see at that position of max layback, uh, pitchers are in this extremely extended position. Their chest is really jutting forward and the arm is laying back, again, as a result of shoulder ER, scapular tilt, and then T-spine extension and rotation. So as an example, uh, a pitcher might have 180 degrees of layback, but he might be getting that, hypothetically, 130 of that from ball and socket, maybe 20 of that from the scapula being able to tilt, and maybe 30 degrees of that from the, the final T-spine extension that happens at that point of max layback. So again, that's just a hypothetical uh, numbers, but those are somewhere around the ballpark of what's probably going on. To my knowledge, that's not been studied. It would be really, really interesting to conduct a study seeing, hey, this is the summation of how players are getting to their, this is the amount of layback they get, and this is where they're exactly getting that motion from. I think it'd be really interesting to study that and see, hey, are there any measurable correlations between injury risk, velocity, et cetera? Again, not just looking at layback as kind of this isolated variable, but what are the actual chunks that go into layback? So hopefully that makes sense, right? There's multiple things that contribute to getting into this point of layback. If you don't have 180 degrees of layback, or even if you do, this is very relevant to know. There's really, really two reasons this is relevant. The first is from a velocity and a performance standpoint. If you're an athlete that you really get kind of pushy, uh, you're tense, maybe you only show 140 degrees of layback, 150, you're very, very kind of tight mover and you don't demonstrate that layback, that ability to relax and whip the arm uh, into ball release. Well, then understanding what we're gonna talk about in this video, understanding these different components of layback will help you actually improve range of motion and get more range from those specific pieces. Uh, as such, you're gonna be able to apply force with the ball over a longer arc. I'm gonna make sure to link that video in the description, which I've already done, which is discussing how to get more layback. So we've already done a video on that. If you're in this category and you're just trying to increase your layback, go ahead and watch that video. Number two, which we're gonna talk about more in this particular video is from a health standpoint or increasing the actual quality of that layback. So let's say you're an athlete who already has 180 degrees of layback, 170 degrees. You're like, well, why do I care? Like I, my arm already, already works, like I can whip my arm well. Well, the answer is, a, you might already be a guy who's experienced some impingement symptoms, maybe some labral pathology, maybe some uh, rotator cuff issues. Uh, maybe you get kind of sore in the front of your shoulder and you feel like tension in the front of your shoulder when you throw. Even if you aren't already having health issues, this is really important to know from a preventative uh, maintenance standpoint as well. So can we maximize the mechanics of your scapula and your T-spine and how the shoulder moves as a whole unit uh, to not only prevent injury right now, but also in the future? So can we get as clean a layback as possible? And this goes back to the example that I've already touched on. 
hypothetically, you know, if you're the guy who you're getting 150 of that 180 uh, from your shoulder and you're getting almost no contribution from your scap moving, you're getting almost no T-spine movement, my take, my opinion would, you, would be that you're putting more total torque through the shoulder and you're putting yourself at higher risk of shoulder pathology versus the athlete who still gets 180 degrees of layback, but they're getting much cleaner layback. Their scap is able to tilt and upperly rotate and clear the way. They've got really good T-spine motion. They're not gonna be placing as much torque, in my opinion, on their shoulder. Again, this isn't something that has been studied to this point. You're gonna see as I go through the video, the logic and, and again, how we use this information to impact our training decisions. So there's really three throwing related shoulder uh, injuries or pathologies that we can touch on for the sake of this video, just gloss over real quick. Uh, the first is internal impingement, which is very, very common in throwers. Uh, this is typically what you're talking about when you, when you mention impingement for throwers. And it essentially has to do with a grinding of the humerus, the grinding of the shoulder in the actual ball and socket in the shoulder joint on what's called, on what's called the glenoid. Uh, and the glenoid labrum. So your shoulder has a, your shoulder socket has a lining called the labrum, and it's basically a grinding that can occur between the humerus and between the glenoid. One study actually took a look at this, and they they found that the group with impingement symptoms actually showed decreased scapular upper rotation and increased anterior tipping of the scapula as well. So again, from a research standpoint, they've also shown a correlation between the lack of upper rotation and the increased anterior tipping of the scapula and impingement symptoms. Uh, this can not only create issues with the rotator cuff, create fraying tendonitis in the supraspinatus, which is one of your rotator cuff muscles, uh, but it can also lead to labral tears as well as you get that grinding in the shoulder joint. The second issue is uh, subacromial impingement. This is also called external impingement, and this is just a different place within the shoulder uh, that that impingement can occur, that that contact uh, can occur on the rotator cuff and get that grinding sensation. And so this actually happens uh, underneath a par portion of the scapula called the acromion process. So that's why it's called a subacromial impingement. It's a pinching uh, or an impingement that's happening just beneath the acromion. So the tissues that are pinched here are supraspinatus tendon, that's one of your rotator cuff muscles, and the subacromial bursa. And so again, pitchers can get this pinching sensation uh, and this inflammation in their shoulder as well. This is also uh, worth noting that some pitchers just naturally have a predisposition to getting this type of impingement because there's a natural uh, anatomical variance in the type of uh, what's called acromion that you have. So there's all sorts of different bony anatomy, bony structures. If you're an athlete that has a certain acromion type, uh, it can actually reduce the space in your shoulder as you go into layback. And so that can actually increase the chances that you might run into some impingement issues. That being said, if you don't know what your acromial type is, I don't know what my acromial type is, that's okay. It can't, if we can maximize all the things I'm gonna discuss uh, through the entire chain, you can minimize the chances of dealing with any sort of impingement issues and maximize the chance that you get this clean layback. And then the final injury that, that we were concerned about is a slap tear, the superior labrum, anterior to posterior. And it simply refers to uh, labral tears that pitchers commonly experience with what's referred to as the peel back mechanism. All you need to know is that your humerus uh, has, your, your long head of your bicep tendon extends down the length of your humerus, attaches to the superior labrum. Now, as your shoulder goes into external rotation, there's actually a torque that is placed through the bicep tendon where it attaches on the labrum. And that torque is again, transmitted to the labrum. And again, over time or excessive uh, external rotation torques, it can actually tear the labrum and peel off that top portion of the labrum where it attaches. So. Uh, this is extremely relevant when it comes to slap tears because we know that increased external rotation torques are likely to be a contributing factor to slap tears. So we can get as much of that layback as possible from elsewhere besides true ball and socket rotation. We shouldn't be trying to necessarily force ball and socket rotation. Let's get as much of that as possible from the scapula and from the T-spine so that we can keep that humerus in a better centrated position and minimize the chance of all these risk factors uh, that could contribute to, again, impingement and or a labral pathology. So I've already kind of answered this, uh, this question, but uh, this is a common one that you'll see, a uh, common debate that you'll see, which is, is more external rotation better or worse, right? You'll see some therapists, some researchers that say, Absolutely not, we don't want more external rotation. More external rotation means higher injury risk. 
Uh, it means you should absolutely never do anything where you're going to increase your ER because now you're going to get injured, you're going to get Tommy John, you're going to get a labral tear, and we should just never do anything that might increase external rotation. And the opposite end of that argument is, well, just about every big league pitcher, every 95 mile an hour thrower, they whip their arm really effectively, they get into these deep stretch positions, and they're able to generate somewhere in the realm of 180 degrees of layback, some closer to 190, some maybe closer to 170, but you're really not seeing hard throwers with 140 degrees of layback. And so it's kind of this two sides to the argument where you need a certain degree of ER, but if you go too far and you get too much layback with too high of velocity, too high of torques, um, now you're just exposing yourself to an unnecessary increase in injury risk. So point being, there is always a high injury risk when it comes to throwing hard. If you're gonna throw 90, 90 95, 100 miles an hour, you are inherently at a higher risk of injury. But can we mitigate those risk factors as much as possible? And I think the answer is yes. So my take on this is, hey, the goal is not 130 degrees of layback, unless you wanna just play in Little League or play at your high school level and throw 82. The goal is to get into the positions and use our bodies in the same way that the highest level throwers do. That being said, can we get the most high quality, cleanest 180 degrees of layback as possible? So my approach, Tred's approach, let's maximize the quality of that 180 degrees of layback. If you're at 130, maybe we can gradually and incrementally get you to 170, 180 from these other pieces in the chain versus just trying to torque on your shoulder and get all of it from there. If you're already at 180, great. We need to stay there, but we need to get really stable in that position, get great motor control and maximize the contribution of those other segments besides getting it all from your shoulder. So now that you guys understand a little bit more about the mechanics of layback, how it happens, and again, why it's important to get that motion from elsewhere besides simply at the ball and socket joint, uh, here's a couple of tips that I'm gonna give you guys uh, and that we incorporate with our athletes. The first is to take care of the posterior cuff and the posterior capsule. Now, I know we're talking about layback, so why does the back of the joint matter? Um, well, the back of the joint very much influences the positioning of the joint. And this is what's called uh, a loss of centration that can occur. And centration is basically like, is the golf ball on the golf tee, or are you getting a translation of that shoulder forward? Are you getting a translation superiorly? Ideally, we want that shoulder to stay centrated, smack dab in the middle of that socket as you go into these aggressive layback positions versus beginning to migrate, being wobbly, unstable, migrating superiorly and pinching everything, migrating anteriorly and aggravating the front of the shoulder, the anterior capsule. So we wanna maintain centration. What can happen if the posterior cuff, posterior capsule gets excessively tight, scarred up, fibrotic, uh, that can negatively affect the centration of the joint and now suddenly you're running into anterior capsule issues, bicep tendon issues, uh, superior labrum issues like we discussed. So really taking care of the back side of the shoulder not just from a strength standpoint, but also from a tissue quality and mobility standpoint as well. So a couple of tools, obviously you can look at shoulder rotation range of motion. A lot of you guys will be familiar with what's called GERD, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. Basically, if the backside of your shoulder gets excessively tight uh, relative to what it should be, then that can be a risk factor. Now, what we do for that is we actually look at the total arc range of motion. You're always, almost in every scenario, gonna have more external on your throwing side and less internal because the entire arc has just shifted. You've experienced what's called a humeral retroversion. So we're not necessarily looking for exact symmetry, throwing side to non-throwing side. We're just looking for that total arc of motion side to side to be roughly similar. If that total arc is 15, 20, 25 degrees less on the throwing side, hey, that's probably now where we have a problem and we really need to take a closer look at this. Another quick thing you can do is any sort of cross body stretch. Uh, we're not as big fans of sleeper stretches, but any sort of cross body stretch is gonna uh, put some tension through the posterior capsule, posterior cuff, and give you an example, give you an idea. Uh, if that's a guy who can't even get across the midline of his body before he gets a huge tug on the posterior shoulder, or if that's a guy who you lay him on his side, put a lacrosse ball on the back of his shoulder, and it's a nine out of 10 pain, those are all indications that this is probably an area we really need to focus on. Some modalities for therapists watching, or again, athletes who have access to a therapist, uh, Shockwave is really great to work on this, as are uh, dry needling as well. So those are some modalities on top of just using a lacrosse ball, tennis ball on the backside of the shoulder. That can be really, really helpful in these cases. Tip number two, uh, as you might expect, is to not ignore the T-spine. So don't ignore the, the mid-back, the thoracic spine. 
Uh, again, as we've already explained, this is fa fairly self-evident. If the T-spine doesn't have good extension, then you're pretty much missing out on a huge contribution to getting into good layback. So guys who are naturally really tight movers and their T-spine is stiff as a board, as they go into layback, you'll kind of just see everything move as one. They don't have that wave like motion, that, that wave of energy that transfers through their spine because again, their spine is limited in the ability to actually extend and to rotate arm side. So you should be able to see this nice smooth wave of energy working its way up the spine. It looks like guys kind of lead with the chest. They get a big chest as they accelerate uh, when they have good T-spine extension. And it kind of just looks like they rotate like a stiff board when they don't. So if we can, let's maximize the ability of the T-spine to get into extension as much as we can. Uh, a lot of high level throwers have extremely mobile uh, T-spines. When we assess big league pitchers, when we assess 99, 100 mile an hour throwers, this is one of the most uh, readily predictable things that we're gonna see in the movement screen is how does their T-spine move? These guys have insane T-spine rotation and they have great T-spine extension in almost every case. This feeds into just generally looking at their posture. If you're a guy who's really kyphotic, naturally kind of hunched over, has that traditional like computer desk, computer program or posture where they've lost that, that extension through their T-spine, think about what happens if this is your posture and from here you try to go into layback. Well, you're not gonna be able to get into layback because you're stuck in this kyphotic rounded posture versus if you suddenly are able to go into extension, you have so much more room behind you to clear the way for layback to occur. You're still gonna get layback if you're in a kyphotic posture. You're just gonna be getting more of it from ball and socket versus being able to clear the way with your T-spine naturally extending to accommodate that movement. So where can we address this? Dynamic warm-up drills. We'll build out custom dynamic warm-ups and correct routines for all of our athletes to groove that T-spine extension, to groove that T-spine rotation. And then just making sure that in your actual training programs, unilateral pressing, unilateral rowing, you can really be reinforcing and driving and strengthening uh, that T-spine rotation without even thinking about it in some of the exercise selection that you do in your actual training programs. Number three is scapular mobility. Uh, now the scapula is an interesting case because it's really at the mercy of all the soft tissue attachments that it has. So you can kind of think of it as like a floating joint where it's really at this mercy of this tug of war between all its uh, soft tissue attachments. And so that being said, if uh, all the attachments on one side are particularly short and all the attachments on the other side are particularly uh, lengthened and, and atrophied or weak, then you're gonna get this scapular uh, malpositioning or scapular dyskinesis. So knowing that the scapula is really at the mercy of the soft tissues that attach to the scapula, well, we need to really be aware of taking care of the soft tissue quality and taking care of stretching any of the muscles that would be putting us in a bad position and restricting our ability to, again, get that scap into posterior tilt. If your scap is stuck tilted forward, this is very commonly what you'll see, it, you're gonna find it much harder for that athlete to get into clean layback. So the position that you see in most cases with throwers is a position of anterior tilt, depression, internal rotation, and downward rotation. So let's go through that one at a time. Anterior tilt. Anterior tilt is the scapula being tilt, tipped forward. Depression. Depression is the scapula being depressed. It's lower. You're gonna see that athlete's shoulder is lower on the throwing side. IR, you're typically gonna see the palm facing backwards. That humerus is being pulled into internal rotation like this. So their anterior tilt, depression, internal rotation. And you're also gonna see downward rotation if you look at their scap from behind. You're gonna see that scapula more times than not is being dragged down by the lat into a position of downward rotation. So why is this a problem? Well, we know when you're trying to go into layback, the scapula needs to be able to get into a position of upward rotation, posterior tilt, right? If you're stuck in this position down here, it's directly in opposition to the positions we're trying to get into. And typically, more times than not, this is a soft tissue related issue. So what are the tissues that we need to be aware of? Well, anterior tilt, what's, what's dragging a pitcher into anterior tilt? Pec major, pec minor, subclavius. Those are some of the big ones. Now, specifically when it comes to the pec minor, one study that I'll link in the description showed a relationship between a shortening of the pec minor and between impingement symptoms. Depression, what's dragging that pitcher's scap into depression? Lat, lat is a big one, overly toned up lats. Internal rotation, what are some of the internal rotators of the humerus? Pec, lat, those are big ones. Downward rotation, what would be dragging the scapula into a position of downward rotation? Again, the lat is a big one. Um, you also wanna make sure to address the subscap. We found the subscap to be extremely, extremely important when it comes to 
getting cleaner layback. It's a spot that most throwers are really not uh, taking a ton of time to, to actually look at, but it is one that you can actually get yourself. You don't need a manual therapist to, to release that, although obviously that's recommended. And then finally, tricep uh, and delt can be contributors as well. So the fourth tip is actually improving scapular stability and the motor control of your scapula. So essentially, now that we're able to get into these positions, you wanna make sure that your body is able to control the scapula in that position of retraction, upward rotation, and posterior tilt. So we're able to clear room for the, for the shoulder, but we also need to be in a stable position. So this is important because what can happen is a down regulation of your ability to actually apply effort. Your down regulation of your intensity if your body perceives any sort of instability. So this can actually be a way to indirectly improve velocity by improving your scapular stability because your body is now more comfortable actually applying that true rotational violence, that effort uh, to the throw. This is one reason why you'll see a pretty immediate velocity decrease in athletes that are having any sort of pain or impingement symptoms. The body downregulates that, that rotational uh, violence and downregulates that intensity which down regulates your velocity and your performance as a way to protect itself. So if you can really get that stability piece and that motor control piece going, which involves coordinating all the muscles that go into play to actually hold that scapula in that position, you're gonna have a more likely, you're gonna be more likely to actually perform at a consistent level and tap into every last little drop of velocity that you possibly can produce. So what does that look like exactly? Well, we're trying to down regulate uh, excessive tone from the lats, the pecs, all the other muscles that we discussed on in general the anterior side of the joint, but we also need a team effort from certain muscles uh, which need to be able to control and coordinate at the same time. So what are these? Well the upper trap, the lower trap, and the serratus anterior are kind of the big three, and in particular those last two, the lower trap and the serratus anterior. Those are extremely relevant when it comes to taking the scapula into a position of upward rotation and posterior tilt. So if you can get those three muscles involved and active at that point of max layback, that's gonna allow you to get into these deep positions and maximize uh, this scapular stability piece of the equation. Why is this important? Well, we've seen in athletes or individuals rather with impingement, uh, one study showed a down regulation of serratus anterior activity. In other words, if your serratus anterior is not working properly, you're unlikely to be able to get into the positions required to clear space for the shoulder to go into external rotation. So we need to get that serratus anterior active, we need to get that lower trap active, and this can happen uh, in a good balanced training program that addresses arm care from a three-dimensional standpoint, Y raises, T raises, any sort of protraction, kettlebell waiter walks. There's a lot of great exercises that target these muscles and get the athlete comfortable being overhead. Don't avoid going overhead. You don't, I'm not saying you need to do one rep max overhead barbell press, but get comfortable overhead. Pitching is an overhead activity, and we wanna be comfortable actually recruiting the muscles involved in holding the scapula in a stable position overhead. So again, kettlebell waiter walks is a great exercise. We posted a video here before that discusses a level one, two, and level three progression for kettlebell waiter walks. I'll go ahead and link that in the description. But get comfortable being overhead. This also ties back to the ability, again, to downregulate the lats, the pecs, uh, some of these other muscles. You need the ability to relax into layback. To be able to hit some of these positions, it's a combination of, again, the front and the back of the joint, uh, understanding when one side needs to relax and when the other side needs to be able to contract. So when we talk about relaxing into layback, one common issue that we'll see is athletes that are throwing a lot of two pound balls or four pound balls, maybe they're doing like black plyo ball pivot pickoffs, that's a common one. And so they actually, because of the weight of the ball, they lose this ability to actually relax and whip their arm into these positions. Because of the weight of the ball, their body instinctively tenses up. They start to hold a lot of tension in their, their subscap, their pec, their lat, because it's a protective mechanism. And so actually lightening the weight of some of the, the plyo ball work and some of the drill work uh, for guys that do weighted ball type stuff can be a really helpful tip to be able to relax in a layback, get into better positions, while still making sure that the scapular stabilizers are firing properly. So let's take all this information, let's put it all together and let's do a kind of scenario to see what does this look like from an assessment standpoint when we look at two athletes uh, who both come to us, maybe in this case they both throw 95 miles an hour, uh, they both have uh, relatively efficient mechanics if you just look at it from a macro perspective, uh, they both have similar frame, similar height, weight, wingspan, 
uh, similar strength numbers, similar power numbers, right? We're gonna call the pitcher on the left Cy Young Carl and the one on the right DL Danny, right? So essentially we understand there's a lot of different factors that go into play here, but two pitchers could look very similar on the surface. When you actually dig a little bit deeper into their movement screen, into how their scapula is moving into, how their T-spine moves, uh, it can really tell a different story as to why one pitcher is kind of facing chronic injuries or uh, not getting into as good positions and another pitcher is relatively, has a relatively clean bill of health and his arm ne is never sore. Obviously, it's not quite the simple. Obviously, you can't pin an injury on any one specific cause. It's extremely difficult to do that. But just as a thought experiment, let's put this all into play. So Cy Young Carl and DL Danny, they both generate 180 degrees of layback, okay? Now again, we know that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're creating that layback from the same spots. Sion Carl is probably getting a lot more of that range uh, from scapular tilt and from his T-spine, whereas DL Danny might be torquing the crap out of his shoulder and really not getting any mobility out of his scap, any mobility out of his T-spine. Kyphosis, DL Danny, he's in a very rounded shoulder position when you look at him on his movement screen. So we know from there, he's gonna have a harder time actually getting into layback because he's gonna have a hard time creating that thoracic extension. Sion Carl, no issues. Limited flexion, so with a shoulder flexion test. DL Danny shows limited shoulder flexion. That's gonna tell us his lat is a little bit more tense. He's probably gonna be, uh, have a little bit more trouble getting overhead, have a little bit more trouble getting his scapula into upward rotation. Sion Carl, no issues. GERD, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, or a cross body stretch. DL Danny, he, you notice when you do a cross body stretch, he feels a huge tug on the back of his shoulder. And you're also gonna notice, uh, potentially with him, a limited internal rotation. So you're gonna see a huge difference side to side with the total arc of motion in terms of his shoulder rotation. You might also see in this case, he's really anterior tilted. So not only is he kypho kyphotic, but his scaps are really tipped forward. Okay, you might see poor tissue quality. So you do a tissue quality test on him. He's super dense, fibrotic, point tender through his pec, through his lat, through his subscap, through his upper trap. He's just got a ton of tissue tone built up. And again, we know that's gonna be uh, a negative indicator for tissue extensibility, he's gonna have a lot harder time actually relaxing everything that controls the scapula uh, into that externally rotated uh, layback position. Limited upper rotation, so DL Danny on a scapula hemorrhythm test, he's gonna demonstrate a loss of upper rotation. Again, we know that is a potential risk factor for impingement symptoms. Uh, poor motor control, you notice on his scapular movement test, that his scap dumps into downward rotation or wings off of his back. Um, so again, these are all things that in a movement screen would be easily identifiable. And if you see this, you see two 95 mile an hour arms, you see them look relatively clean when they actually throw on a mound. The movement screen tells a different story. Now you actually have something to address from a health standpoint with DL Danny to make sure, hey, even if he has had a clean bill of health, we really need to address all these different points on the checklist to make sure that he can stay as healthy as possible moving forward and get as clean of layback as possible. And then finally, I just wanna end with a couple, a couple of throwing cues, a couple of drills that might be helpful for you guys to actually work on. Again, on top of actually just preparing the tissues and mobility stability component, uh, on top of that piece, um, some actual kind of throwing cues and drills that can help you train this feel. Um, while we don't like over cueing, this because we feel like it kind of takes care of itself in a lot of cases uh, once you've addressed the tissue and the mobility and the stability side of it. Um, one cue that can be helpful is throw the armpit. Uh, in, the, in other words, for guys who get a little bit pushy or guys who have a tendency to uh, not get into that extended position, throwing the armpit is a cue that can help them understand, hey, the armpit is kind of what leads the way. It's not the elbow leading the way and it's allowing that space to clear into layback. So throwing the armpit, that's one cue that can be helpful. Um, throwing the armpit downhill, right? There can be guys who kind of force this position. They're like, oh, I need to get more layback. And so you start to see them lean uphill, try to extend early to try to create, the, their, create that position to layback as much as they possibly can. So you really wanna make sure that they're getting that layback, but they're still driving the ball downhill. They're not cheating it. So don't force uh, this layback position. It should happen relatively organically, relatively naturally. Uh, as far as drills that can kind of uh, cue this feel uh, if it's something where uh, the athlete just doesn't really understand how to allow their scap to relax and tip. Some things that can help, uh, one medicine ball wall taps can be helpful where there's a, a focus and a coaching uh, emphasis placed on allowing that layback to actually occur from the scap and from the T-spine versus all from, from the humerus. Uh, 
the scap wall dig drill can be a good one as well. And then uh, controlled internal rotations at 90 degrees. So with a J-band with 10 pounds on a cable machine, just grooving what that feels like to actually feel, hey, this is where the range of motion should primarily be coming from. Now, if you just stand on a cable machine and you walk out and you allow it to lay you back with 10, 15 pounds, if, if you try it and you just clamp your scap down its anterior tilt, you clamp your rib cage down into thoracic flexion, you let it lay you back, at least what I feel, I feel a stretch through my bicep. Uh, I feel a slight pinch through my bicep tendon. And again, we know that anchors on, on the labrum. So I'm putting stress on the labrum in that position. Now, if I actually allow my scap to free up, allow my T-spine to free up, all I feel is nice and controlled uh, posterior tilt. Uh, I feel the subscap turn on and control that movement and my shoulder perfectly centered in the socket. No tension on, on the bicep tendon or on the front of my shoulder. So again, that can be another way to experiment with just working on the motor control of, hey, what does it actually feel like when my scap goes into posterior tilt and I get that extension from my T-spine? How do I actually control that position? And then finally, if there is a major, major timing issue, if a pitcher lands and his arm is still way down at his side and his scap is really uh, tilting forward into anterior tilt, or he's really, really hunched over at landing, if there's a major timing issue at landing in particular, uh, that is going to make it very difficult to get the scapula and the rib cage in a good position to accept layback on time. So if that's the case, then a lot of our backwards chaining uh, drill work will be targeted to, to address that whether that's things like a lasso drill, uh, chained into a rhythm rocker drill, chained into uh, step backs or walking wind ups. Uh, we're trying to, again, get the, the pelvis, the rib cage, the scapula in a good position to accept that layback properly. So again, just understanding there's a ton of pieces that go into play here from mechanics, from the motor control at the joint, stability, mobility, uh, soft tissue. There's a lot of considerations that go into play. Hopefully you understand that it's not as simple as just External rotation is good, external rotation is bad, 180 is good, 140 is bad. Uh, all layback is not created equal. That's really the point I wanted to get across, whether it comes to velocity or improving your ability to, to stay healthy and having clean layback. There's a lot of considerations that go into it. These are the types of things that we look at in our movement screens and when we work with our athletes. A lot of them have had impingement issues in the past or are trying to throw harder. So if you're interested in learning more about that, email us, contact at I'll see you guys in the next video.